Hello and welcome to another episode of When Life Hands You Lenins. In this episode, I took a little bit of a different approach to the show simply because I had a little bit of inspiration. So with Miss Alana, who is the wonderful guest on today's episode, we worked together and recently I had found out that she was or is in the music industry. She has a vast experience in event production and artist management and festivals. So I wanted to sit down and have a conversation with her because she had quite a wide array of experience under her belt. So a little bit about Alana was she started working on Warped Tours in 2013, which is how she entered into the industry. She has since worked on Riot Fest in Denver, WPRK Fox Fest, Self Help Fest, Rock on the Range, Welcome to Rockville, and many others. She also worked on Arrow Through the Heartland, which was with Mumford and Sons, which is pretty impressive to me because I'm a huge fan of Mumford and Sons. She has also worked with a bunch of artists, including The Fray, B.B. Rexa, Laura Marling, Churches, Paramore, A Day to Remember, Falling in Reverse, Wage War, Founding Fathers, and many others. She sent me a list of stuff to talk about, and this list of artists she's worked with is far too long. She has also high-fived the former president or vice president, Joe Biden, which is kind of cool again. She has a degree in... American Studies with an emphasis in pop culture. She was born and raised in Denver, Colorado, which she will tell you all about in just a few moments. She has experience in, like I said, festivals, management, touring, event planning, radio, law, research, and studies. She also says that, uh, kind of a, a disclaimer here that When you send a piece of fan mail to your favorite artist, they are unfortunately not the ones that are reading it. Sorry. Uh, The best way to get through to the artist was to reach out via Twitter or the band. She stated that she had this one letter to Falling in Reverse that included the writer's lucky Pokemon card, and she says that she carries it with her. I wish I would have asked her or known this about her in the uh, prior to recording. I would have had her tell this story. It's kind of interesting. Um, she apologizes that it never reached Ronnie. Um, she said most of the time it's just reading if there's any psychos stalking the band to make sure that they are banned and do not enter the venue that the band is performing at. So Alana has quite a bit of interesting experience within the music industry and touring, and all kinds of information. She even tells you a little bit about how to get in to touring and event production um, because she at one point was and still is where you are, which is a budding industry professional. So with all of that being said, I hope that you enjoy my conversation with the amazingly talented Alana Bro. So I have Miss Alana here. She's actually a colleague of mine here at work. And I wanted to take a little bit of a different approach for this episode because the previous episodes, all of the guests I have known, I've actually communicated with them prior to that. But with this one, um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach because Alana and I haven't actually, while we work together, we haven't actually sat down and got to know each other and what she's interested, what I'm interested, career goals, all that stuff. Um, So I thought this would be kind of a unique episode because um, just for that reason, and we haven't gotten together for that reason, so we could keep kind of keep an interesting conversation going. But um, the thing that sparked this conversation or this episode was Alana had mentioned that she has an interest in the music industry. So I'm like, you'd be a good guest on the podcast. Let's take a little bit of a different approach to this. Let's not get to know each other for this reason so we can learn and figure each other out on the podcast. So Alana, thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for uh, being on. So let's 
kick off the episode like anybody, like any other episode, um, by telling us a little bit about who you are. We have to know who you are so then we can kind of ask questions and dig sure. a little bit deeper. So tell go us a little bit about who you are. Like, kind of go with a little life story <laughs> here. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I grew up in Denver, Colorado, so I'm not from here at all. Um, and how I really got into music is I kind of played a cruel joke on my parents. Uh, I really loved uh, Fall Out Boy when I was a kid, and I still do. I have them tattooed on my ankle, actually. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to go see them really, really bad. This is the summer of 2005. I am 11 years old, 10, 10. I haven't had my birthday yet. And I see that they're coming to the fairgrounds. I don't also see that this happens to be Vans Warp Tour. So I say, hey, mom, dad, my friend is going to go see Fall Out Boy. I want to go too. And they're like, all right, cool. Being the helicoptery parents that they were, I thought that would you know, never come to fruition. But somehow, seven in the morning, I'm there sweating in the middle of the desert heat and seeing my favorite band perform live. And my little 10-year-old brain was like, yeah, this is great. So I kind of took a back seat to the whole music music thing. I started playing uh, stringed instruments in orchestra. I learned to play every single one. And then I switched into choir, switched into theater, kind of got a taste for the behind the scenes life in technical theater in high school. And then I went to college and dropped all of it. Um, At that point in my life, I had been working, volunteering for festivals because I couldn't afford them. And that's actually a really great way to kind of get your foot into the door in that world. And if you were a more extroverted person than I was at the time, you probably could have bypassed like the whole college thing or any kind of higher learning. You can just go straight in. I did not. (laughs) My parents wanted me to get a four-year degree. So um, as my backup, I decided to pursue chemistry and biology which uh, didn't work out, and so we ended up leaving school with a liberal arts degree, which was actually okay because I took all my LSATs and things for pre-law, so if that ever becomes irrelevant in my life again, I'm ready. I'm set. Um, But all throughout college, I worked festivals. I volunteered for management companies. I had internships across the globe working with different various artists, whether big or small, and just kind of getting the experience. We'll never actually having that satisfying feeling of getting a paycheck at the end of it. Um, I started working for, out of college, I worked for our local Broadway theater here in town and um, kind of, again, let it fall. And I don't know if that's the the lifestyle I chose or if that's a, a common story with a lot of um, industry kids. Is you get a taste of it. And through internships that you get through school or by chance, and that's where it falls. The internship lasts for three, six months, and that's all you can get because there's no way that this big management company has a little spot for you. Um, No matter how many times you try and go back and send them those really annoying emails like, hey, I graduated college now. I have a degree. (laughs) I'm looking for work. (laughs) Right? I'm like, please hire me. Um, No matter how many annoying emails and how many nice emails you actually get back, I've been really pleasantly surprised. All my industry contacts have really taken the time to sit down and write really nice emails with really great information about how their journey was or um, places they've worked and people they've met that they think might give you a shot. Um, But, you know, just trying to get that shot is really difficult. Uh, I've been spamming through Indeed during this time, just trying to see, hey, is there any festival work? I'll stand outside and die in the sun. That's fine. I'll be happy with my my skin cancer at the end of the day. Um, And I actually found um, a management company for artists who were just like just emerging artists. They were going on the road for the first time to promote their work. And they um, this company had set up the idea like, hey, these are your this is your first time. We've done it. We know what we're doing. We'll help and guide you for the first couple times of your tour so you know what you're doing by the time you get to the big leagues and you can have a fighting chance. And I saw that they were hiring for a manager, which ended up being more of a sales kind of pitch because you're trying to entice these 20 to 24 year olds who don't have any money to sign away like 15 grand 
to a management company who says, hey, at the end of the day, you're probably going to lose more money on the road than you make, but the second time you'll probably break even. And that's a big order for anyone who's really my same age. <laughs> I don't have that money. So um, it, it was a tough sell and I didn't end up getting that job. But the uh, owner of that company was as interested in me as a case. He saw that I had put in 10 years of work even though I had just graduated from college. And so he took me on as a special project to be a booking agent. And from there, I was promoted within the month to become a tour coordinator. So I was actually running the 60-odd tours we had on the road at the time. And had that position continued, I would have ended up doing my life goal of being a tour manager, festival coordinator. But as most things do end in this industry... We live and die by the money that we get. And as I alluded to, 24-year-olds just don't have that kind of money. And if they say they don't, even though they promise to pay you, they'll just disappear. The brand brand breakup, you know, it's it's just how this life works. So the company closed, and it's, again, my dreams are on stall. So we're back here learning um, New, meeting new people, learning new things, and just trying to get back out into the world that I really love and miss. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely not an easy journey, especially once you're in there. It's easy to keep going and kind of get full of this excitement and hopes and aspirations. You're like, finally, I have a break. I've worked so hard, mm-hmm. and now I can just keep going. And then, boom, life hits. Um, so, kind of going a little bit back into the beginning of your story, what was it like? Were your parents supportive of this music industry journey, or what were what was kind of their thoughts at the time? kind of moving into yeah, this spot. Yeah, absolutely. My, I was really lucky in my situation. I have a sister who's five years older than me, and she went into uh, art, straight out, fine arts, and ended up doing pretty well. She's a coordinator at a museum in New York City, um, so she ended up <laughs> doing really well for herself. So that makes it easy for me coming in and say, hey, I want to do performing arts, which everyone, you kind of have the rock and roll glaze over your eyes. You're like, oh, yeah, there's big money in that, way more than being a curator at a museum. Um, So they were, I wouldn't say they were gung-ho. They definitely had their reservations. I was shy as a really small kid, so they were like, oh, you're going to fall back into that. You're not going to network as much as you should. Um, have a fallback, have a fallback, and which is why I entered in college thinking, all right, well, my fallback is genetics. Let's just, in case something happens, I'll be in a lab coat and I'll be happy about that because at least it's interesting. Um, but that kind of dropped off the mat and left me with no other option but to kind of pursue my dreams. And because I was working at it. I was getting internships. I was kind of going out of my way to network with people who may or may not actually be great network contacts. My parents turned out to be pretty okay with it. Um, And they've been supportive, which is rare and still really great, but um, they just, they don't get it. You know, it's it's hard to get if you're not immersed in it. And so whenever... I'll be excited and be like, hey, mom, dad, I got this great unpaid internship. I work six hours a week, but it's for a really, really, really big name band. And they're like, great. So are they going to offer you a job at it? And you're like, no. <laughs> yeah. So I know that feeling. Yeah. It's, um, it's, my parents are very understanding as well. Um, my dad was in a band, so he kind of, under, many, many years ago, so he understands kind of the basic concepts. And my mom, I think, is just at a point where she just trusts what I'm doing and, and has confidence in me and supports me to like 150%, which is really helpful. That's the best thing. There's kind yeah, of like yeah. this weight off my shoulders, like I don't have to please my parents and they can just kind of let me do my thing and they just trust what I'm doing. And it makes it easier because there's that, there's not that stress on your shoulders like, oh, I have to get a job and I have to make sure my parents are happy. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's definitely not easy to do. What was? What are some of the festivals you worked and how did some of those opportunities, you don't have to name all of them, <laughs> and granted you might not be able to talk about some of them, but just what are some of them, maybe top two or three, the favorites that you've worked and how did those opportunities come about? Um, I was, there's definitely the top three. Four. Okay. Uh, I worked Warp Tour every year I was legally able to. So after I was 15, I could start volunteering. Um, long may it rest in peace. Um, I worked Welcome to Rockville, which was my first 
festival that I was working for the festival rather than for a vendor or for an artist, which was a different side of things and which really made me interested in being a festival coordinator or something along those lines. And uh, Riot Fest, I kind of fell into working. I actually, that was the first time I had gone to a festival and actually um, attended, like bought a ticket rather than being my cheap self and uh, finding a way to volunteer and slide along through. Um, But I had met uh, a manager backstage and ended up helping haul gear and break down uh, the tents and things like that for their merch. But definitely my all-time favorite festival to have been a hand in. Um, Well, obviously Warped Tour, that place has such a hole in my heart now that it's gone. Um, But, you know, I don't even remember the name of this festival. I was in high school. I was 17. I think it was my senior year. And literally I had called up the band because I knew a friend of a friend of a friend who was their mom. And (laughs) I called them up and I was like, hey, I know you're going on tour um, in, I think it was Asia and Europe tour. But this festival is happening in in Denver, and you're from Denver, and live here, uh, and um, I'd really be honored if you would come play, even though it has nothing to do. It wasn't a music festival. It was a safety and human trafficking awareness <laughs> festival, um, so a lot of like big booths and police and fire departments, and then I was thinking, hey, this is something I was really interested in at the time and had promoted a lot with um, my clubs in high school, but wouldn't it be great to get more people out here? Let's have a local band who is worldwide, um, has worldwide acclaim, and get them out there and see if we can get some more people out to uh, learn some more about trafficking and the dangers in our community. Um, So that definitely holds a special place in my heart because they did make that stop. They literally got on a plane to the Denver International Airport, or a ride to DIA, immediately after their set. They didn't even break down. They just hired local crew to break down. And so that that will always have a, a special place in my heart. Cool. Um, so what's it like kind of... I've never worked a festival. I've never been to a festival, ironic Poor enough. Baby. I know, I'm still young. I've, <laughs> I've been offered to go to numerous festivals mm-hmm. because of the publications I write for, but it's just simply... Time-wise, it's not feasible, and now with this new full-time job, it's almost impossible, impossible to do anything. To do anything, and then festival tickets are so expensive. And then not only that, just I can get festival tickets for free, but it's the extra stuff: the hotel, mm-hmm. the food, travel, the traveling. It's just like that's just extra expenses I just don't have the budget for at the moment. But what's it like once you're into a festival? What's it like, kind of getting in there and then? Volunteering because a lot of these festivals they just hire volunteers right. and expect nothing else. Like you're volunteering your time, you just want something on your resume and you move on. Yeah, not even that. Half the kids are like what I was in high school who volunteer because they're too broke, but they want to go see their favorite band. Exactly. Or they just they just have some extra time on their hands, yeah. especially in high school. They're just like, I want to go see my favorite band, like you had said. But what's it like for somebody on the other end of the spectrum who? wants to make a career out of this, whereas those kids, they just want to see their favorite bands for free and maybe get a free T-shirt. <laughs> What's it like getting transitioning? Is it hard to kind of transition from like a volunteer into like a paid like full-time position for the festival or crew? Yeah, or what's that like? I would say like? that's almost impossible. Um, a lot of festivals hire out their labor, so they'll hire a, a staffing company to even just get volunteers. They'll, they're the ones who post the ads and have the budget for that and the marketing expertise. Um, so I've worked a lot with the contractors, which you would think would be the better of the way to get involved with the festival because It is, again, they're working more with small fries rather than um, dealing with a lot of the other stuff that goes into planning a festival. But it is nearly impossible. Whenever I (laughs) apply to festivals, I always make sure to write, or even any any gig, like if you do any VIP staffing or anything like that, I always make sure to write in there, I'm looking for this for a career. I have experience, I have education, and all this other loads of baggage of crap. Um, I'm not here to see people. If I if there happens to be a band on that roster that I want to see, cool, but I'm here to work. It's more of a bonus. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not even like I've worked festivals where a couple of my favorites had gone on stage and I'm I'm just grinding out. Like I'll sit at that merch booth as long as you want me to or that info tent, whatever it is. 
I can listen to them on my on, on Spotify whenever. You know, like I'm there to do the work. It'd be cool, but I'm not going to leave my position because this is what I came here to do. Which for the people on the ground, those people, uh, the staffing coordinators and things like that, they really appreciate because a lot of kids do show up. They work their 10 minutes of parking shift duty, and then they disappear. Um, I've had that happen to me a lot of the times. They're, at the start of the day, there were five people at the merch table, and by two hours in, it's me and my friend that I t- dragged along. Uh, so it happens a lot of people ditch out and to go see the band, but the reward for staying isn't great. Um, you can talk to the staffing coordinators. You can talk to the other people who are getting paid or the other volunteers. Um, but at the end of the day, those festivals have hundreds of volunteers per day. Sometimes you only work one day of a three-day weekend festival or whatever. Um, or it's a traveling festival, and they have to worry about making sure they have four more people for the next day. So there's a lot on their minds at that time. So trying to network on the ground a day of is, you, you can try, <laughs> but you're not really going to gonna get too far there. It's more of a make sure you get the card, make sure you get an email. Um, I always send thank you emails or physical cards if I end up getting a mailing address on that business card um, to say, hey, thanks. Um, next time you're in town, look me up. Or if you have an opening for kind of like an entry level step, let me know. You know, I'm just trying to put feelers out there as, in any way possible. But yeah, day of, just don't it's, even it's just too much work. It's mm-hmm. like it's like working behind the scenes here yeah. at on campus. It's like once you're on the ground, it's almost hard. And there's there's people coming in asking questions. Mm-hmm. That, there's no way you're to gonna network. Forget. You're yeah. gonna forget. There's no way to like a network and actually take the time to know who these people yeah. are. There's just no way. Yeah, even those knockout kids who really you see them they're telling you all the answers, they're helping you out, and it sticks in your mind, but then you fall asleep in the next day, or a lot of people in our industry have a little too many too many, too many beers or whatever. Whatever they're drinking. Um, and you just forget. So it's, it's more on you, the seeker, uh, to get that information and send it out once the festival's over or in a month or so. I really like that idea that you have of sending a thank you email because something as simple as that can make you stand out amongst the hundreds. It really or, jogs their memory. It too. does. The the hundreds of other people who are volunteering probably didn't even think about, especially the kids that are mm-hmm. just here to see their favorite band and they disappear after they're done working their parking shift. You know, they're just like, oh, I'm going to use this as a thing, and then just disappear into the crowd. But going that extra mile, I also do the same thing. Like I'm always thinking, and what can I do to stand out? And that's so important in this mm-hmm. industry. Like it's all in who you know. So building that strong connection is going to, you know, open up doors to your next opportunity. What has that led to? Have you? What are some of the feedback you've received? Has that opened any opportunities for you by doing that and going that extra mile? I've gotten a couple internships out of it, but a lot of the times it just guarantees me a spot back for next year. Um, like for w- Welcome to Rockville, unfortunately I couldn't work it this year, but last year I had sent out the cards to, you know, to uh, carry the coordinator at that time and um, just really tried to build up a rapport. So when they came back for this year the, in, in April, um, they actually sent me an email out saying, hey, previous volunteers, we wanted to give you an opportunity first. And generally that happens. You're on a mailing list, right? But in this particular instance, they had used my name. So I knew it wasn't just a, a blank mass email. So that's it's, it's touching to see that the work that you're doing, even those small little things, actually do make a difference. And then, yeah, as I said, I got um, an internship gig out of it once. Um, and that's actually a festival I just worked uh, last month, is I just went back to that internship and was like, "Hey, if you need hands, I'm available still." And that's you know sometimes as easy as it gets. You know, you can just go back to a previous contact and be, "Hey, you probably don't remember me, but I worked for you and I'm available." And so they know that you're reliable, you're interested. They'll probably hire you on again, even if it's no money. <laughs> uh, yeah, even if it's no money, and a lot of people that's hard to understand, especially like mm-hmm. when you're trying to explain it to somebody like, oh, I got a new job, and they expect like, what's it pay? Like, oh, it's volunteer, and it's an unpaid internship for six months. And But it's at a festival that I'm going to use on my resume, which granted, those internships do help, 
because they really build your knowledge and experience. They build your knowledge, and as you said, this industry is all about who you know. So if you have worked for so-and-so, and the person you're applying with or even a volunteer gig knows that person, they trust their judgment or Maybe they don't, but you know. Hopefully they do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they see that you work with them. You're an easy hire on. And I've I've had that happen where I know somebody who knows somebody mm-hmm. who introduces me, and next thing I know, I get an email from somebody saying, "Hey, so and so gave me your information." That is so important in building those powerful connections because I don't think I've ever had anybody get hired or friends that I know of that have been hired out of the blue just because of their resume. Yeah. It's because they know somebody or because somebody recommended them or because they've worked with somebody before. It's never just, I applied for this company in the middle of Idaho or Utah. And they're like, oh yeah, we saw your resume. We want you to come in for an interview. Like That just doesn't happen unless you have that long resume of experience and you're applying for a senior level position. But those Even connections- Even then they should probably know you at that point. At that point, yeah. They have probably heard of you or should have heard of you. I guess it takes a lot of understanding to this position, this job, this industry. Um, a lot of people who are hiring you, are looking to hire you or manage you or whatever, have also grinded out their 10,000 hours and are, they know what it's like. And unfortunately, that only gets you so far. Um just because your manager knows where you've come from and has climbed the ladder in a similar fashion, which is also another thing. Uh, industry, most in- other industries, it's very clear how to get from one place to another. You go to law school, you go to med school, you do your residencies, you work as a summer intern, whatever it is. Not so much here. I have talked to a lot of different people about how they got to where they got to. And you're just trying to say, hey, you have a really great job. How do you do it? Please just hire me. And in small parentheses there (laughs) under some text. Um, And they're all different. They're all vastly different. I have a lot of friends who kind of are in the same spot right now where they're just stuck at a nine to five. And on the side, they're photographers or they have uh, zines that they go and interview people for or whatever. Um, So it's all a lot of passion projects where you found something, you found something you were good at within that something and climbed up. Or you knew somebody who needed something at the perfect timing. That's how a lot of my friends who are managers got the job. Their friends were in a band and they didn't know what they were doing or just needed somebody else's guiding hand. That's almost how all managers start. Yeah. It's like, oh, I have my friend did this, or my cousin was Mm -hmm. in a band and didn't know what they were doing, but I knew what I was doing, or I wanted, I had a passion for getting them booked or like trying to see their success. Yeah, absolutely. So it's almost confusing on how to get to where you want to go. There's no right path, truly and honestly, there's no right path. And that's frustrating. It's frustrating for you going through it when you're like, I've worked at this internship for three hours for two days a week, and I don't know if it's going to get me anywhere, but it's on my resume. Or for your parents or anyone looking in, like, wow, I see you are working really hard. When's it going to pay off? So it's super frustrating and takes a lot of patience and sympathy which goes back to, you know, the people hiring you also probably went through something similar or they're just really, really, really lucky (laughs) and got to where they were at the right time, right place. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my next question is when you said the 10,000 hours kind Mm -hmm. of coming back to that is working with musicians directly because you worked for an event company Mm -hmm. and you worked, what was it, as an artist manager? I was more on the touring end and the coordinating end, but I was always in the manager's offices because that's what I wanted to do or at the end of the day, not necessarily for that company because, yeah, it was really salesy, um, but I wanted to see, yeah, how do you handle their social media? How do you handle them when they're just 21-year-old kids who don't know what business presence online really means or how to 
Um, adult sitting. Right, yes. Adult sitting is actually 100% exactly what you're doing, no matter what stage of the process you are. If you're an intern just getting um, going to the studio and cleaning up afterwards, you're like, oh, man, come on. You know the trash can is right here. Why are they all beer bottles right there? What are you doing? It's two feet away. <laughs> so it, it really is adult sitting so that you're letting the artist kind of do their thing and you're taking responsibility for it. So if you don't have that kind of game plan going in, even in a removed festival workplace or if, if you're just cranking out at the info tent, um, you're really just allowing the artist to do their thing. And that's what the business end is all about is let the artist do their thing, we'll clean up after them. And does that get to a point where you just want to pull your hair out? Like, is there some yeah. kind of, I, I can imagine, so like <laughs> you're, you're babysitting, adult sitting, mm-hmm. and you get to a point where it's just like, okay, now you're not doing it on accident. You're mm-hmm. deliberately leaving trash and becoming- Because you know somebody's Because there, you yeah. know somebody's going to come after you and pick it up. Because does that get to a point where it's like, okay, it's time to, to grow up a little bit? Yeah. Um, definitely, it's it's also a part of internships when you're just oh man, it's my job to take out the trash, really. Yeah, and as an intern, uh, I'm not getting paid for this. Um, so yeah, in that case, it gets frustrating. Definitely, I don't mean to name drop at all, but I had worked for Mumford and Sons for a while, and um, just going every other Tuesday, I think it was, to their studio to clean up after them. I'm like, at the time, I'm 20 years old. You are all in your 30s, like come on, you have kids at this point. You should know when to take responsibility after yourselves. Um, And that's a lot of the young kids' game too. You're sitting here at your internships and your boss comes and he's like, hey, you didn't take out the trash. Go take out the trash. Go clean up my office. Go do this or that. And unless you kind of, unless you want to say no and leave your internship, then like, what are you going to do? That's kind of like when you when you pick up an internship, that's the assumed role yeah. is you're the runner. You're the bottom feeder. You're mm-hmm. the bottom feeder. You're cleaning up. You're doing the stuff that nobody else wants to do. You're cleaning the toilets. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've heard a few industry professionals, some of them uh, at the behind the scenes tour here, they, they say, well, I started, I got in at a studio, and if you tell me to clean the toilet, that's going to be the cleanest toilet you've ever seen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's very important, especially when you're getting in. Um, I I have tried to take the studio route, um, but I just kept telling myself, like, it's just not for me. Um, I think the experience would be very valid for myself, but I just, like, I just didn't want to get stuck in that realm because Mm -hmm. when I get into something, I really get into it and I do really well at it. And I feel like I would solidify myself inside of a studio and I need that interaction with the outside world to just kind of keep myself sane. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's, it's, I don't know, it's kind of a battle within myself. But anyways. No, that's also a good thing about the internships, whether you have to take out the trash a thousand times or not, is you really do find out what side of the fence you want to be on. Do you want to be in the studio? Do you want to be in management? Do you want to be outside on the road? Do you want to be hauling gear? Like, uh, I remember I looked at a, a position and it was like, you must be able to lift 75 pounds. And I'm like, mm, not, not for me. I'm not going to work out every day. I'm not CrossFit. Um, so... You know, you really find out, and it's a safe way to find out too, because again, internships, you're at the bottom, they don't really need you. Um, So if three weeks in, you're like, you're a test project to them. Yeah. You know what? This is just not it. They're like, all right, cool, bye. You know, and there's there's nothing there's to no, lose. You didn't sign a contract. Mm-mm. Maybe you signed an NDA. Probably signed. An That's NDA. but other than that, there's mm-hmm. there's nothing tying you to yeah. that studio. And at least from my experience, I've never quit an internship, but I know several people who have. The people at the top aren't going to hate you for it. They're not going to badmouth you at all. Um, if they ever receive a call about you, you know, just checking that you did do, say what you did on your resume, you were right. Um, they'll be like, yeah, they worked here for three months. It's not, they don't have any grudges. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Unless you were really. And, yeah, really unless you were terrible. So, disrespectful. You know. <laughs> and, yeah, I have. It's. I have some friends who are out in LA, but they work for like a really big studio, and they're cleaning up after big rappers. And some of them are getting banned from the studio because of the the stuff that they're doing, and it's just disrespectful. So, kind of coming back to what you were saying, and the artists having to kind of adult sit mm-hmm. gets old, but that's just kind of the thing you do as an intern. 
And that's just kind of the role you have to assume as an intern. Like if you're going to get an internship at a studio, that's just like, all right, I'm going to be doing the stuff that nobody else wants to do. Mm-hmm. And if you're lucky, somebody will take you under your wing and exactly. maybe learn a few things. And you might get moved into like, but that's just the point of moving in and, and going that extra mile. Mm-hmm. And you see their work, they're mixing an album, for example, and you're finished taking out the trash, you're ready to go home, go in the studio and say, hey, mm-hmm. you're mixing, you mind if I sit in for an hour or two and, and just listen? Sure, they're going to be more than happy to teach you. Granted, you know the contracts and everything that are signed mm-hmm. and all that. And that's why you do sign an that's, MBA. <laughs> that's why you do sign because sometimes it's a big project. Um, so you you want to continue going into the touring industry. That's just where you think you want it, or you know yeah. you want to be. Where and you probably answered this earlier, but it's it's slipping my mind. Where was that initial click that said, "I want to do this. This is my." dream (laughs) um honestly it does um go back to follow up way i'm a big fan i'm so sorry everyone um but they went on hiatus during my entire high school career which is as any moody high schooler can tell you the worst time to have your favorite band go away so you know you're stuck here listening to music for me it was from 2008 i'm like oh man really could use some some new stuff um and they came out with their album in 2013, right as I was graduating. So I got a bunch of my friends together over the summer, and, you know, it's pre-college summer. You have to see your friends as much as possible, but you also have to work so that you can afford college, blah, blah, blah. Um, So we finally got ourselves together and went to see them for their first post-hiatus show. And I don't know if it's because they were my favorite act or because I was with all my friends um, or even the venue we were at because it was um, Denver has a lot of like medium sized venues where it's standing room only, but you're really close together and you can kind of feel that community vibe whenever you're all uh, jumping in the air or whatever it is that you do. Um, and I just that really hit me in the face at that concert. And I was like, you know what? I don't know anything about anybody else in this room or anybody on the planet, but I want to make sure everybody has the chance to see their favorite band perform live. And I don't care where that puts me but I'm going to work it out somehow. And um, I really ended up liking the feeling of live music. Um, I don't know if that came from the background of performing and just knowing the rush that it is to get on stage or to see that um, really happen. But I was always looking for those opportunities, and that's festivals came in. And when I did get to intern for uh, Mumford & Sons, I was able to go on a couple legs of their tour and my managers, when we got back, were like, so it's awful and grinding, isn't it? And I was like, no, mm-hmm. it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just kind of the things that fall into your lap um, by happenstance. You know, it's like, oh, I like touring, but, you know, it is a long hours away from your family, away from your, your home. And if you don't like it and you can't stand it, then you really don't like it. Um, but that opportunity really opened my eyes. And I was like, yeah, no, this is something I need to do. I need to go on tour, and I have been on tour, and it was wonderful, stressful, but wonderful. Um, And just being in that that arena where the the music is just at your face, super loud all the time, you're losing your hearing, it's it's something I wouldn't give up ever. No. What about when you're in the crowd, Mm -hmm. you're... um, you're at Fall Out Boy, and you're thinking, I don't know about anybody else, but I want to do this. I want to make sure that everybody has that chance to see their favorite band. What was it like when you're on the opposite side of the coin, opposite side of the fence, and you're actually working and doing that? Did anything kind of change? Because you can assume what that role is going to look like when you're in that crowd, but when you're actually in that role, things are a little bit different. Yeah, there's a lot of the stress, and... Um It really related to me from working tech theater. Um, When you're backstage, day of show, you're like, oh, my God, everything is going wrong. This is terrible. Uh, And then at the end of the day, show went fine. No one in the audience can tell what happened. Um, So... But backstage, everybody's freaking out. Yeah, backstage, you're all panicking. And, yeah. uh, Nobody in the audience. No but that's has. what a good crew is. Exactly. If your if your audience can't tell, that means you've done your job. And a lot of the the thoughts I had when I um, first kind of explored where I wanted to be in the industry was like, you know what? 
I don't care if I'm remembered at the end of the day. I want to make sure everybody had a great show and that it goes on because that means I've done my job. Um, and so working on on shows, like I've, I've been on festivals where my job ended at a certain time in the day and then I was free to enjoy the show, but I didn't want to. Once you're in that mindset for the day, you're in the mindset for the day. You're clocked in. Mm-hmm, exactly. So even though I could go see my band perform and be front and center because job privileges, um, I didn't really care. I was like, can I can I go side stage? Can I watch tech do their stuff? Like, it's got to be something. There's got to be something else. Can I help? Like, <laughs> how can I help? Um, you're really super in that mindset, and that's going that extra mile, like we had said earlier in the show. Yeah, it is really interesting flopping over to the other side of the the world once you go from fan to employee. You're just like, huh? Yep. Like this is what it's like. This is what it's like, and I think I was lucky in that case because I had performed and I have done behind the scenes work in a lot of different roles. So I was really prepared to know. Okay, yeah, performers are going to be in the performer mindset. They're not necessarily intending to be rude to you, but they need what they need and they need it now, um, and that's okay, you know. And so having that experience for a lot of my childhood and high school years really prepared me to be. On the receiving end, <laughs> like you know, you got to pack down that tent now. You got to hand them the mic now. You, you have to have everything tuned now. Um, and it's a lot of stress and immediate stress. You know, it's not necessarily the same thing as crunching deadlines or whatever per se on that side of the field. There is obviously um, for making tours and making changes and putting out albums. But when you're on day of. It's immediate stress, and if you can't handle that, and if you can't, if you, people being snappy at you or mean to you, it's just something you can't handle. Then you learn that very quickly, and it's very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, and can shoot down your next opportunity. Um, so you've worked at festivals, you've worked at shows, you've worked with a lot of bands, a lot of people, um, a lot of you've seen a lot of fans. You've, I'm sure you've seen some crazy things that fans have done. I can imagine uh, the people watching at a festival. <laughs> it's the best, actually. My favorite thing to do at festivals is download Tinder and see how many of the band members or their managers or whatever are on there. And it's just really hilarious to see what they say, what pictures they choose, and you're just like, ah, so everyone else is a failure too. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like this is what we're doing on our off time. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've worked with a lot of these bands and have seen them on dating sites, dating apps. Um, so is there any band that you really want to work with that you haven't? I mean, that's a, a blurred line between I'm a fan of you and I'm a fan of your work. So obviously, me being me, I'm there like, is a difference. Fall Out Boy, please let me work with you because I love you. Um, I would probably be a really terrible worker, though, for them because I just want to watch them side stage and um, try to make those memories with them rather than doing my job. Um, so <laughs> probably not a great idea. Don't hire me, but please do. Um, oh, man, it's just a lot of... A lot of acts I would like to see. Um, One of, I've not worked for them. It was one of those moments where I was working the festival and then went to go see them. And I was like, oh, I would rather be working for you right now. Um, Was this band called The Star Set. And they're very committed to what they do. They sing about space and they dress up in astronaut suits. So they're they're very committed. And this is Florida heat um, in the middle of the summer that they're donning these spandex suits with helmets. So it's real... Real gross, real fast for them, I'm sure. But I think it would be hilarious to see what happens backstage because they have a ton of different instruments, a ton of different people. And I think it would just be a lot of fun to rock around in that kind of outfit. Um, There's another band, too, which I actually might have a connection to, so I have to to sort that one out. Mm -hmm. Um, they're, They're called Palais Royale. And they're kind of a new blood on the scene, if you will, um, and have a hit or miss reputation. But I think they're doing something right now that isn't really done today. Um, they have a lot. It's kind of harkening back to old rock and roll, where their lead um, lead male singer is very sexualized. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of the time we're like, "Ooh, yay!" We we still ogle our rock and pop stars, anyone really, um, but his performance plays into that and it's it's dramatic it's um their dress up that's it's it's really cool to see and i think it'd be fun to um kind of pop into that world and and um 
more for like a research side almost. Like I'd almost want to write a paper at like seeing how this this figure, you know, you're sexualizing this figure in your own music. So in your performance. It's yeah. kinda like with that, it's kind of like there's people sexualize everything in today's oh, yeah. day and age. Everybody gets offended mm-hmm. for so easily. Granted, I take offense to some certain things that are yeah. really nitpicky. I mean, you're you're entitled to, but but it's how you some people it. they mm-hmm. say like, oh, the sky is blue, and then they argue with it, and they're like, I'm offended. Yeah, the sky is not blue; it's <laughs> light blue, it's baby blue, and then they just like they get offended by that, and it's just like these simple things that people get offended to. So how? I know, granted, I've never heard of that band. Um, so how do you think, especially in today's with your experience in touring and stuff, how do you think that stuff portrays? Do you think a lot of people are aware when they're listening? Because sometimes they'll listen to artists that, and they don't really know, they just like their mm-hmm. music, but they've never done any background research. Yeah. And how does that kind of factor into like when you get to the show and it's like overly sexual and they're not expecting that? What what kind of happens there? Yeah, um, actually, as alluded to, I listen to a lot of pop punk, and a lot of that is, if you break down the lyrics, is kind of gross, you know. And we give rap, and I think a lot of times country too, like kind of a bad rap of saying, "Oh yeah, you're just talking about sex, they're talking about whatever," um, and it's very blatant. Where it's in the music, we just don't. We kind of bypass it. We're, we're listening to it with the glazed expressions, like, oh, it's so pretty sounding. It's not in your face when it's in more of a rock pop genre. And I think that's what you expect when you go into a show. It's just the same thing. Like you're saying these words, and you know, maybe you're doing a little pelvic thrusting or something in your weird dance moves on stage. Um, but we're all, it's safe. You know, it's a safe thought. You're like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm." we're talking about how he loves someone and she doesn't love him or whatever. Um, We're kind of, or it's like, yeah, it's okay. We get the general theme of the story. It's fine. Um, But on the other side of it, when it is unexpected, for me, I, as a, as a industry kid and rather than a just bystander walking into this thing, um, it's usually obviously the opening acts that people don't know or not familiar with. Um, which also is a huge pet peeve of mine. If you're going to a show, listen to the opening act. It's on the ticket. Please listen to it so that you can have some fun. Um, it's always nice to hear your lyrics scream back at you, even if it's just by that one dude at the bar. Like, please, please go listen to that. That's my soapbox. I'll get off. All right. Um, <laughs> like, when it is unexpected for me, um, seeing it kind of as a research opportunity, I think it's fun. I think it's fun to see what people do when they're like, oh, that's not what I expected. And they just they look at their group, and they 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 share an expression like, oh, I don't know, I don't know about this, but it's it's something you should expect in music. Music's always been a little taboo, and it's always been on the, had a toe in the taboo world. Now, how much of that toe is in, depending on your genre and your choice of music, um, it's something you should expect a little bit. Like good art should make you uncomfortable. And so if it's good art and it's something you can also enjoy, like, yeah, I can enjoy feeling this kind of confusion. Um, and I think it's also, like you said, it goes back to our easily um, offended nature or culture right now where it's like, it's so easy to, so should I just slide into that? Or should I let myself enjoy this because it is good art, it is good music? So I think that's, it, it comes out as a personal conflict. And if you are so upset by it, you just go to the bar, go to the merch line, go whatever. Like, there's ways you can avoid it. For sure. Mm-hmm. There's definitely ways you can avoid it. Um, but with music and with, with any art, really, you have to be open minded. Mm-hmm. You have to be, with, I would say, with music, you have to be. I mean, you're never going to like anything if you're you're not. No, if you're not open minded and you're setting the expectations for somebody else that they're in control of, that it's their reputation, it's their image, you're going to be very disappointed. It's their income, too. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So maybe you might not like it, but somebody else may be coming specifically to see that Mm -hmm. live, you know, somebody that is a big fan of them. And I really like that quote of good art should make you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I really like that. I might even get that tattooed on myself. and so keeping that open mind with these bands is very important. And I'm sure you've seen it time and time again where people are either offended or they leave 
or they didn't expect it, or they're disappointed because the band didn't do this and that. Yeah, I'm actually pleasantly surprised. A lot of the bands that um, I myself might have walked out on, people tend to stick around, and I'm I'm pleasantly pleased by that. I I also work in our Broadway theater here in Orlando, and I've seen more people walk out for a Broadway show that's been on Broadway for ten years. Um, Saying, "Oh, I didn't know what I expected." It's been it's been ten years. Um, <laughs> and then people leave a show where the opening act who only plays for half an hour um, or less, it, it, which is I think to, warms my heart a little bit. You know, it's it's good to see that people are at least willing to try. A lot of um, new up and coming acts. A good thing to do right now is to have mixed genres play together. So you might have an opener who's rap for a group who is more rock um, to get that kind of blended crowd in and get more tickets sold. And a lot of people, well, yeah, they'll come just for the opener because it's their friend or whatever. They tend to stick around. If the band sticks around and you make a good image on yourself, and that's that's the job of either a good band leader or a good manager, um, you can actually have a really, really great night and be, open your eyes to something that you weren't looking for. And that's what's really important in music, I think, right now, in live music, is to get that cross-genre, um, get those listeners who might not have heard of you or not really cared about you because they already have enough uh, pop music in their lives or whatever. Um, yeah, I think that's that's really where we should be moving, moving towards and producing these shows for a lot of different people. Mm, I would I would agree. Um, so what is, you've worked, like like we've said throughout the whole show, you've worked lots of festivals. Have you worked any, like, because I'm in the electronic music scene. Mm-hmm. Have you worked any electronics? I have not yet. That's not really um, my world. Like, I like to hear and see the, the instruments being played. Um, that's just my preference and my history of learning learning to play music and, and instruments. Um EDC just opened up its list of um, employing and volunteer positions. So I was thinking, like, you know what? It's time. It's time that I get into this world and see what it's about. And even if that's just from, like, an info booth, ticket booth standpoint, um, you know, really see what this is about. Because that makes me a better potential employee, a better potential manager, you know, to really have my eyes open to all the worlds that are available to me within this industry. Kind of coming back to your... Um, you're going way back to the beginning of the show. You mentioned that you learned to play all of the stringed instruments and everything. Were you classically trained? And you learned, like, what was your favorite instrument? Um, I, my home was viola. I started on viola. I stayed on viola. And I love it because it's not, it's played like a violin, but it doesn't sound, it's not as high. Um, it has similar strings to more warmer. like a cello. It's warmer toned. And when you're first learning to play, I think that's really important for a small child so that you're not, you know, annoying your parents and your family with the squeaky squeaky E's and high up there. So um, it, it does, you know, right, it has a really nice warm tone. Um, to, I, I only learned the other instruments because to be in our chamber, chamber orchestra, you had to learn the rest and not necessarily be proficient, but be able to read and follow along with the music, you know, should somebody disappear and drop out and you need an extra violin, like, or you know, so that they can rearrange it should something happen. It never did. This is middle school. No, like we're not traveling anywhere. But it was something cool that we did. That now I can say, hey, yeah, you know, you can throw me that that cello, and I'll I'll figure it out. Like, um, I don't know if that's anything I would ever you know, pursue or yeah, just bring back into my life. I really want an electric violin though right now. That's the that's the splurge I want to yeah. find. Is it's it's a cool it's fun to go back to and fun to just kind of mess around. I really want to learn the violin. Like it's one of my favorite instruments because mm-hmm. I watch people play like I'm sure you've heard of Lindsay Sterling. Yeah. Um I watch people like her play and they just get so into it. And the emotion and energy that is put into it. It's just so captivating to me. And I feel like, I don't know, it's just such a beautiful instrument. Like when I'm orchestrator and when I'm like writing strings mm-hmm. or whatever in the computer, because I don't know how to play an actual violin. <laughs> I don't know really anybody that plays violin or has a violin. They know how to play, but they don't have one. Yeah, always. Or all that jazz. So I don't know, I just really like strings. And then I have a digital piano at home that I bought 
way back yeah. in middle school, high school, uh, which is for another story. But <laughs> I bought that, and now there's like a string preset on yeah. there. Mm-hmm. And it's just like playing it. It's just relaxing. You can play whatever chord you want, and it's just like, you could like put me to sleep. And it's just such a, like, I love stringed instruments. They're just so beautiful, and they, they really can kind of drag out the emotion. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I'm getting on a soapbox here. <laughs> like, like um, I think, oh, another thing that you mentioned that I learned was that you can speak French. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that was kind of something, because we're all, like, at work, we're trying to figure out, like, who speaks what languages. Someone speaks Spanish. Oh, my God. Somebody <laughs> speaks Spanish. We have a Spanish caller coming in, and, like, uh, does anybody speak French? And I'm, like, it was interesting to learn that you spoke French. Um, where did you learn that? Uh, I learned it in high school. They had two options. You can speak French or you can speak Spanish. And I can't roll my R's. So it was French for me. Also, my sister spoke French. So if I ever needed any help, I can be like, hey, um, she lived in France for a year or so. Um, so she's she's real good. I'm not that good. <laughs> uh, I can make my way through. Uh, it would probably be really easy for me to fall back in on because um, I did speak it for five years. Um, we had to be proficiently fluent to graduate high school. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Not <laughs> Big easy. balls in the court. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I've been to France. I've been to Switzerland. So I've used it, but that's probably the last time I used it, like 2015. Um, so actually when I first got the job here, I first shadowed in the international office and somebody was speaking French at the time. So like my big old ears, like, hello, hello, <laughs> let me listen and eavesdrop on your conversation. And so literally the, literally the drive home, I was like, got to practice French. Got I started like thinking in French and tried to remember if I could remember all the, the verb conjugates and everything like that. And I was like, hmm, I cannot. <laughs> yeah, it's not. <laughs> it, it's definitely a muscle. It's yeah, it's not an easy language. Like I've like tried reading it and like heard people speak it, and it's it's a very complex, but it's a beautiful language. So now that you told us, you have to say a little something for us. Um, por qué? <laughs> <laughs> um, it can be something as um, I'm excited to go to work today, or that's a lie. You want me to lie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, je ne peux pas aller au travail aujourd'hui. Porque je veux dormir ou uh, ou je veux de glace ou de glace. Let's go to Jeremiah's. <laughs> oh, so what, what did that translate to? As I do not want to go to work today because I'd rather sleep or get ice cream. Interesting. Yeah, I just love that just like kind of slurring. It is super slur. It's the worst. Like, okay, it's not the worst because I've never studied any other language, so I can't. Be expert on this. My humble opinion is the worst language to read and then try to speak. Because the joke is you forget half the word. Just just don't. Just blend it into the next word. Um, so <laughs> like you read it and you're like, that's a lot of letters. And you say none of them. Yeah. So uh, half the time, even the verb conjugates, they end differently in writing. But they all sound the same when you say them. It's like, can we, can we not French, please? Yeah, because it's like one of those languages where you have a 27-letter word and you say three of them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. it's like, mm, that makes it super easy to do. Um, so yeah, we've got almost an hour oh, of sweet. content. So is there any like shout-outs or any way people can follow you or follow up with you if they have any additional oh, yeah, questions definitely. for you? Um, all my handles are the same because that's something you should definitely do. Do not have the same, like different handles across Twitter or... That's, that's something you learn yeah, for promoting bands. That is, that is business knowledge. There you go. Mm. Fun facts. Um, yeah, so I am Lana Calling a... Uh, I just was going to start my whole name. That's not it. <laughs> Lana Calling, so L-A-N-N-A-C-A-L-L-I-N-G, um, kind of playing off London Calling. Uh, I made it before I went to London, so there you go. Um, <laughs> so you can find me on Instagram and Twitter. I don't really tweet at all because I forgot to download it when I got a new phone, and I just never fell into that vibe, but I'll be there. I'll check it. Um, my Facebook page is public, Alana Bro. Um, I'm part of a lot of different communities online, and I can definitely give you a, a push in the right direction if you want to do live music or management. Um, definitely have some hookups there for you. And also internships, you know, like a, a, it comes with a lot of weight saying, hey, I was a past intern. This person would be a great fit for your internship if you're still working on it. So, um, yeah, uh, hang out there, guys. Like, 
There's a lot of cool people in the world. You don't have to go to New York, Nashville, or L.A. to really walk, work it, get big in your backyard, get your feet wet, make sure it's something you want to do and where you want to be. Um, make a little name for yourself, get the experience, get uh, the knowledge and the resume, and then go out. If that's if that's your plan at the end of the day, but there's a lot of cool stuff in your own backyard, you know. Find your local stuff. That's where you're going to get your experience. Excellent. I was just going to ask you: Is there any tips or tricks <laughs> that you have for the people yeah. listening? Yeah. You you nailed it on that one. Is uh, you don't have to be somewhere. Just figure, learn what you have now and make make it sound as good as you can, or make it work as hard as you can, and opportunities yeah. will come. Exactly. You know. Thank you, uh, Alana, for being on the show. Um, I will put all of Alana's contact information in the show notes. Mm -hmm. um, And thanks again for being on the show. I really appreciate your time and uh, expertise. Yeah, thanks. Anytime. And there you have it. I hope that you enjoyed my episode with Miss Alana Bro. She is such an amazing person and very talented. And I wish her all of the best and success within the music industry and her career endeavors. With that being said, I invite you to sign up to my mailing list, which is the easiest and best way to be notified when a new episode of this podcast is live, and also get some tips and tricks on the music industry, and I share some of my stories and insights on how to navigate and become successful and land that internship within the music industry. I also invite you to support this podcast on Patreon as well. It's uh, pretty exclusive and very cheap. Um, You can pay, donate as little as a dollar a month. Any little bit helps. And of course, any money that I receive for and through Patreon will go directly into this podcast and making it better for all of you. I also would greatly appreciate a five-star rating in Apple Podcasts or wherever you tend to listen to your podcast episodes at, if that's on Google Play, if it's on YouTube, simply give it a like, a comment, let me know. I always am looking forward to feedback and how I can make it better for you and what can I provide for you. If you know somebody that's an industry professional within the music industry, Uh, please send me an email or send me a message on Twitter or however and let me know. And you can also send them the guest request form as well. As with every other episode of this podcast, all of the links for me and the ones that I just mentioned, as well as Alana, will be in the description and show notes below. Thanks again for tuning in this week on When Life Hands You Lennons. And we'll see you next week on When Life Hands You Lenins.